You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. As always, it's good to have you aboard. Here on the first half hour of today's broadcast, we'll talk about input management for that soon-to-be-seeded corn stand, if you haven't planted already, as most have not, here in the state of Kansas. And we'll begin on weed control pre-emergence. And with details on how to pull that program off successfully, Kurt Thompson, weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We're drawing from an article you might want to check out in the Agronomy e-Update series to be posted this coming Friday, and we'll tell you how to access that. Talking, though, about the dry weather conditions that we have out there, Kurt, which is uh, lending some consternation to corn producers out there, does the dryness suggest anything about one's pre-emergence weed control program? Well, I, I still stand by my uh, my saying that I used uh, all winter long and the last two, three years with the glyphosate-resistant weeds we're battling. Uh, use a pre or don't call me. So <laughs> even though the soils are, are dry, the conditions seem to be dry, uh, we are, in fact, one day closer to the next good activating rainfall. And so get that pre-emergence out there on that dry soil surface. It's going to be stable. Uh, once we get rainfall, it'll be activated and we'll be in business. So it's an essential is where you're coming down. I'm saying it is essential to try to assure that we can manage these resistant weeds. That said, then, putting together one's plan as far as product selection, one has quite an assortment of modes of action to choose from here, right? Uh, we do. And, you know, one of the things with corn is we have as many herbicides for corn as, as any other crop that we could grow. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is the corn acres in this country, companies develop herbicides uh, for corn. And uh, we continue to reap the benefits of that. Well, what you choose has to be predicated upon the expected weed pressure that uh, could come to bear on the crop then. Absolutely. There are some herbicides that are, you know, very common. I'll start out just talking about triazines because good old atrazine, I put that on top simply because all the other herbicide groups that we may talk about are going to work better if they have some atrazine with it. And, of course, atrazine complements all these other herbicides, increasing their activity on a, a variety of weed species, especially broadleaf weeds. But even atrazine has a little activity on, on certain grass species as well. So how does one go about matching atrazine with the proper added chemical in that mix? Well, I'll, you know, I'll start out with uh, probably uh, one of the most common classes that we, we mix with our atrazine, and that is our chloracetamides or the uh, pyrazoles. Now, that's a, a group 15 herbicide. What they do is to control annual grasses uh, very effectively. They also are excellent on our small seeded broadleaf weeds, especially the real problem, palmer amaranth and water hemp. And so most of the time we are seeing these chloracetamides or the pyrazole used in combination with atrazine, giving you a, a broad spectrum broadleaf, and grass weed control. And there are several premixes that fall under that heading then? And, and there are. We have combination products like the Bicep 2 Magnum, uh, Bicep Light 2 Magnum. We've got Degree Extra. Uh, we've got Outlook Atrazine. There's a number of those. The Pyrazoles are products like Zidua or Anthem. Those you'd want to mix with atrazine, but they also have Anthem ATZ, which has atrazine already in the mix. So those are uh, some combination products. And there are a whole host of generic chloracetamide atrazine uh, premixes out there that are, are available for us. The pyrazole or the pyrosulfatol is actually the active ingredient in the Zidua and Anthem or Anthem ATZ. That chloracetamide does have activity on kochia, 
Uh, the other products like the acetochlors, the dimethenamides, the esmetolachlors really don't have that great of activity on kosher, but the pyroxysulfone actually does have good activity on kosher. So if one has herbicide-resistant kosher as an issue, that's a consideration. That would be a good choice. Other classes of herbicides, though, that could fit the pre-emerge application task as well, several of those to consider. Well, we have a number of products that fall in the, uh, the HPPD inhibitors. That's the group 27. Those are some products like good old Balance Flex or Corvus. There's also Callisto. The active ingredient is mesotrione in Callisto. We have a lot of generic uh, mesotrions out there. And so we've got a number of herbicides that are premixes that include these HPPD inhibitors. And we've been using over the years the Lexar and the Lumax. Uh, Syngenta now has a newer one called Acuron uh, that has uh, another HPPD inhibitor in that one. So there's two HPPD inhibitors in the Acuron. Uh, there's also uh, Dow's Resicor uh, that has mesotrione in it. And then we have some products that are atrazine-free. The Z-Max or Acuron Flexi uh, do not have atrazine in them. And that would allow you to be able to use these products that contain an HPPD inhibitor without atrazine if you happen to be in a, a watershed where atrazine can pose some problems for you. Uh, they can really enhance control of some of the larger seeded uh, broadleaf weeds uh, like velvet leaf, they help out on morning glory. In some cases, they help out on sunflower. They'll also help out on kochia. And so we do see a real benefit by adding these HPPD inhibitors in the mix. Of course, they all have activity on pigweed, and the more modes of action we can throw at pigweed, I think the better off we are. Kurt, what about the class that's known as the PPO inhibitor herbicide category? Yeah, we have, you know, some PPO herbicides that are, are labeled uh, head of corn. They're actually designed to be uh, early pre-plant. So, for example, Valor. We can use Valor ahead of corn. If you're in a no-till system, it can be as, as short of early pre-plant as seven days. Uh, if you are in a conventional corn system, it actually is 30 days. That also applies for a, a product called Fierce, a product that contains Valor and Zidua. We've heard that one before, right? Mm -hmm. Both of those have the same restrictions, early pre-plant, uh, seven to 30 days. And within that we do have to receive an inch of annual precip, and if we haven't, we, we should wait to plant the crop. And the ALS inhibitor products, where do they fit in? Well, we have a, a number of ALS inhibiting products out there. Uh, they've been around some time. Uh, they have activity on a number of the broadleaf weeds. Some of them also have activity on grass weeds. Again, because of our resistant complex uh, we generally are, are using these ALS inhibitors as a component of other products just to broaden the spectrum of weed control and, and having multiple uh, modes of action in the tank mix. What we've offered here, Kurt, is an outline of many, many alternatives. Uh, we haven't touched upon nearly all of them here, but it gets back again to using the so-called reference numbers, which indicate mode of action of the products, right? That's correct. And in our uh, weed guide, uh, we have all of these pre-packed mixes. Each chemistry is followed by a number. And when we see two different numbers, we're talking about two different modes of action. Uh, if you see two active ingredients with the same number, it says... They're killing that plant in the same way. It's the same mode of action. So that's what we're looking for is, is a mixture of modes of action. But, of course, we do have to have activity from each of those modes of action on the specific weed species that we're battling. Otherwise, 
you know, we're only dealing with the one mode that's active on that particular species. So simply go to the Chemical Weed Control Guide for Field Crops 2018 edition from K-State and cross-reference those modes of action. You can pick up a copy of the guide if you don't have one on hand already through your local extension office. It's all online as well at the agronomy.ksu.edu website. And look for that article, which gets into this in some further detail in the e-update series soon from the Agronomy Department on pre-emergence herbicide programs for corn. And Kurt, thank you for coming over. Always a pleasure, Eric. Weed Management Specialist Kurt Thompson, K-State Research and Extension. And we'll be back to talk about starter fertilizers for corn next here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today and glad to have you back as we continue our conversation on corn planting management and this time a look at the value of applying a starter fertilizer with that corn at seeding time. Our guest has been looking at this question for quite some while now. Dorvart Ruiz Diaz is a nutrient management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. There can be benefit in this in some circumstances, we need to stress that right out, the starter fertilizer for corn, Dorvar. Yes, Eric, this is certainly one of the good opportunities we have to um, improve uh, early growth and, and, and ultimately, hopefully, yields in corn with uh, the application of starter fertilizers. And when we talk about starter fertilizers, we, we're really talking about small amounts of fertilizer that we um, making sure and placing that fertilizer close to the seed so that nutrient is available to the to the roots early in the season. And again, uh, that can be particularly important for corn for many reasons. And, and of course, we can use starter fertilizer for other crops like soybean as well. But again, particularly corn can benefit from this. And, and when we talk about the, the nutrients, typically we tend to focus on phosphorus primarily. And a lot of the reason for that is because phosphorus is not a mobile nutrient. So again, having that available phosphorus close to the roots early in the season can be particularly important. But uh, nitrogen can also be a component there. And, and again, depending on the situation, uh, having some nitrogen with a starter fertilizer can really benefit corn early in the season uh, as well. There's also the opportunity to put some other nutrients. Uh, for example, in many cases, we may need to put some micronutrients such as zinc uh, that can be beneficial for in, in some situations for corn. And again, in the starter fertilizer uh, situation, we are able to put small amounts of these nutrients, place it in a position that is going to be uh, available uh, to that root. And again, uh, things like micronutrients, if we need to put any or any of those uh, nutrients, this could be an opportunity. To, to take advantage of that application as well. The key question here, though, is, is there always an economic yield response to a starter fertilizer application? Yes, that's a key point, and, and there are many factors that we have to keep in mind there. Uh, again, I, starter fertilizers can benefit significantly, not just early growth, but also yields. But again, what are those conditions that can can lead to that yield response, which is ultimately what we want to see from, from this application? And again, typically, if we're talking about phosphorus in particular, the, the first step is still uh, soil testing. And if we are dealing with a situation where we have low testing soils, the use of starter fertilizer is typically uh, result in significant yield increases. So, so in that kind of situation, I will strongly uh, recommend uh, the use of starter fertilizers, even in combination with uh, uh, another placement, such a broadcast application or um, application of phosphorus with a strip deal in some situation as well. And if we're talking about uh, very low testing soils, recommendations for phosphorus rates are high. And that kind of a scenario, splitting that application and putting some of that phosphorus perhaps with the broadcast application, maybe some people already did that application last fall or maybe doing it this spring pre-plan. But again, still putting part of that phosphorus with the starter fertilizer can be particularly beneficial. 
and and again in that load testing situations um for phosphorus, uh, we need to, to make sure and provide that nutrient uh, available to the corn, um, especially early in the season, again, for root development. So that's one of the main main points that we need to keep in mind for phosphorus in particular. Soil test is, is one of those uh, uh, driving factors. If we're talking about other nutrients, uh, potassium could be also part of a starter fertilizer program, uh, and those will be, of course, mostly for uh, producers in uh, perhaps in the eastern part of the state where we do tend to see more low 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 testing potassium and and again that is a similar situation. Uh, low testing potassium soils, anything below 130 parts per million or so, can potentially benefit from the use of starter fertilizers with potassium in the in the mix. Mm-hmm. So again, uh, that would be one of the main things we need to look at. And just for clarification, back to the phosphorus, the benchmark low P level, you say below 20 parts per million would be the signal that uh, the starter fertilizer will likely pay off. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. That's that's uh, the responsive range for phosphorus. So again, uh, if we are looking at those two nutrients in particular for phosphorus, is anything below 20 part per million, and in the case of potassium, uh, below 130 part per million, where where we can uh, potentially see a yield benefit from this application. Here's a question: You say Dorvar, you receive yearly, and the, the answer remains the same. Does it matter what source of phosphorus one would apply as a starter with corn? That's an excellent question, Eric. And and, and again, it it is a common question because we do have multiple options out there in the market uh, in terms of sources, and we are looking at we are talking about liquids. Uh, uh, many people will use uh, primarily liquid for uh, starter fertilizers, but dry fertilizer uh, as well uh, for phosphorus. And and there are some differences, of course, in in terms of the chemistry and and the reactions that happen immediately after application of these nutrients, uh, these fertilizers, application to the soil. However, uh, agronomically, they are all uh, similar. And and, and again, these uh, reactions that happen in the soil when we're talking about, for example, uh, polyphosphate or orthophosphate in the case of phosphorus, reactions happen in a matter of hours or days. And again, uh, by the time the crop is actively taking up nutrients, uh, again, those are all equal. So if we are applying efficiently um, uh, these fertilizer sources, again, I think that the focus should be in what's going to be more uh, convenient for the producer in terms of uh, handling, application systems, and so on, as well as the price. Ultimately, is right. one of the main factors that should be driving our decisions uh, since, again, agronomically, uh, these products are all equivalent. Economics are everything, considering corn prices now, where one gains from the nitrogen from that starter fertilizer application has to do with residue cover and whether one's fully committed to no-till, you say? Yes. Again, I did mention a little bit nitrogen can be part of the, of the nutrients that we, we are putting early in the season, and, and it can have a, a big impact. And, and, and again, of course, in this case, we are talking about other factors driving uh, nitrogen availability. Tillage is one of those, and typically if we are dealing with no-till systems uh, with heavy residue, that kind of situation can really benefit from putting some nitrogen at planting time. And, and again, that just help provide some available nitrogen early in the season. Mineralization is not going to start to provide nitrogen until later after, after we have warmer soils uh, later in the spring. So again, that limited amount of available nitrogen early in the season is, is one factor. There are also other things that can drive a response to nitrogen starter fertilizers, and, and one of those is the nitrogen program that we have. You know, if, if we are thinking about putting most of the nitrogen as a side dress in that kind of situation, we still need to have some nitrogen early on. And, and of course, nitrogen uptake in corn is not very high initially, but we do need to have some amount of nitrogen early in the season for that early establishment. And again, hopefully coming back later as a, a citrus time if we are putting most of the nitrogen at that time, which again can have a significant impact in, in terms of uh, how that corn basically developed the rest of the season. Well, and we'll finish on this. The success of any starter fertilizer application for corn revolves around the placement of that product. This has been studied extensively at Kansas State University over the years. Yes, we have. We do have a lot of data at K-State uh, looking at options for placement for starter fertilizers, and most producers will be probably looking at three uh, main uh, placement options. One would be in furrow, which is basically putting that fertilizer in contact with the seed in the 
for the other option, maybe the, the, the traditional, uh, still I would say the gold standard is the two by two placement, which is two inches away and two inch uh, uh, deep uh, placement. And one uh, approach that maybe is becoming more popular also in recent years is uh, dribbling the, the fertilizer on the surface. And of course, we're talking about a liquid system primarily in this in this case. Uh, in the case of infurrow, one of the main limitations is really the rate that we can use in that particular situation. We are limited by the amount of, of salts that we can apply, and that's usually driven by nitrogen and potassium. Mm-hmm. So if we're looking about a 30-inch row spacing corn, we typically uh, don't want to put uh, more than about 8 pounds of, of nitrogen plus potassium because, again, we'll start to have seedling damage and, and germination problems in corn, and, and that's one limitation there. So for low low volumes, in furrow uh, is is very efficient. Uh, of course, uh, it's it's, uh, it's an excellent placement. But again, we are a little bit limited in terms of rates and and sources as well, because uh, we will not recommend any urea sources to put in furrow because the urea tends to um, generate some uh, ammonia that that becomes toxic to the seedling. In the case of uh, drivel and two by two, um, we do have a lot more flexibility with, with the rates and. Technically, we can put, in some cases, uh, even 100% of the nitrogen uh, with that placement as long as we don't have any contact with the seed and making sure that distance in the 2 by 2 or drivel on the surface are maintaining certain distance from the row. So that gives us a lot of flexibility for volume. It gives us uh, flexibility for sources. We can use uh, UAN or or, uh, any urea-containing fertilizers without any major problems. And again, especially if we're talking about higher volumes, the drivel on the surface is equally effective as 2 by 2 excellent results in different tillage systems. So definitely one good alternative for producers, uh, especially if we are trying to put a little bit higher volumes of fertilizer at the planting time. See the article in the latest agronomy e-update newsletter out of K-State on starter, fertilizer rates, and placement for corn. That was posted this past Friday, March the 30th at agronomy.ksu.edu. Dorvar, thanks for the overview right here. Thank you. That's Dorvar Ruiz Diaz. He's a nutrient management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. We'll be back in a few moments with more on this Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. At times, I had to walk away from the story and lay the book down. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University. By the time the train reached Budapest, the Forsythia had come to bloom. All else was gray or vaguely yellow-green. A few of the trees along the outer ring road showed the swelling of buds, though the city retained the wet rawness of a recent snowmelt. It was 1943. The above is the first paragraph of Chapter 37 in the book I just finished reading. I reread the last few pages as the story, a fictional story, makes a few generational jumps in time at the end. The story is fictional, but oh so real. Plays out in France, Germany, and Hungary during the pre and then the war years, 1937 1945. I should not have read it at this time of the year, April 3, 4, and 5, which I remember as the final days of the war after some hard fighting by the Canadians around and through our homes. The fictional stories in the book 
the invisible bridge are so real that I could tell my oldest daughter over a cup of coffee similar happenings I had heard as a 12-year-old or experienced and felt the fear of. Being confronted and remembering reinforced what I had recently read in another article, stressed that war experience can be traumatic for children as much as grown-ups. There's a photo of the author of the book, Julie Oranger, on the back. I've looked at the photo, a young woman, and I wonder how can someone who was not there write this story? Yes, it is fiction, but it is not. The Chicago Tribune writes, The Invisible Bridge is a tale of war-torn lovers, family and survival of the luckiest rather than the fittest. I didn't read the book as a love story. As I read it, I tensed. At times, I had to walk away from the story and lay the book down. I walked the hill. Memories and emotions flooded back. The truth is, they do not lay buried deeply. A few weeks before the liberation, my father was preaching in our local church, a church already mentioned around 1100. The church building standing today is an old church, an old building, beautiful. I've climbed the tower and looked around in the top and out over the village. The mighty church bells were stolen by the Germans to be molten, I remember. A few days before we were liberated, a V-1 rocket came roaring over low, very low. It was fired not far outside of town from a site hidden in the woods. It would never reach the place it was aimed for, probably Antwerp. But it ran down a little past the church and exploded, killing people and collapsing buildings. This is 73 years ago, for some people a whole lifetime. Years later, I read an article written by my father in Remembrance in which he said how difficult it had been to help and provide the needed support to the many families of whom he had buried their loved ones, one after the other, dead in one blast, injured. It's good that people write things down, even though it's not always easy to read. Years ago, Ian, my middle son, asked me while we were working on the farm what I remembered of the war, World War II. Right then, there was a small, single-engine airplane flying and circling overhead. I told him I would not have stood here then. I would have moved behind a tree. April 3, 4, and 5, I will remember. I will remember what I know what I have experienced as a child, 13 years old at the end of the war. April 4th, today, at 11.30 a.m., there will be a remembrance near a small white iron cross where Amy Pirard, a Canadian soldier, was killed along the dirt road while advancing close to our home. A class of today elementary students will be there to help remember. They will be told the story. Piriard's grandson, now a grown man, has visited the site and was given the small breast pocket Bible with the bullet hole which killed his granddad. Someone found it at the site after the battle was won and saved it to give it where it belonged. This is no fiction. Over the years, I've met now old men who were young then who fought in World War II. I've always thanked them, knowing what I know. Just behind the men's in Warnsfeld, where we lived, the Netherlands runs a small river which originates in the hills of Germany across the border. There's a small wooden bridge across that river, the Berkel, In spring 1940, I walked across that wooden bridge with my parents, older brother and smaller sister, to get out of town as the German forces were advancing, and it was expected 
that there would be fighting. In 1945, at the end of the war, the Germans blew that wooden bridge up to slow down foot patrols of Canadians. That little bridge was rebuilt and is maintained in its original form. When I'm back, I walk the narrow chestnut lane and cross that narrow footbridge, and I remember. In my yard, Forstethia is blooming again. April 4th, 2018. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University. That's our time for today. We appreciate you tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.